Okay, the iron gaze. I'll call this a, a case of hunter-gatherer complexity. This is another complexity. It's another probably old-fashioned nowadays um, concept in hunter-gatherer studies. Um, but um, let's begin uh, with where the Iron Gates is. For those who may not be so familiar with that area, it's the section of the Danube Valley which straddles the border between uh, Romania and Serbia, uh, when effectively where the, the River Danube carves its way through the Carpathian Mountains. And this section of the river was dammed uh, at this point here, with the Iron Gates 1 dam and Iron Gates 2 uh, 80 kilometers downstream and archaeological uh, surveys in advance of completion of those dams uh, resulted in the recognition of some 50 55 sites with Mesolithic and or early Neolithic occupation on them and if you you know, study that in detail, which you won't have time to, you will see, in fact, that there are far more me Neolithic sites there than there are Mesolithic. There's only about 20 sites of, uh, of those 50 on uh, Mesolithic occupation. Uh, but interestingly, most of those sites with Mesolithic occupation also have early Neolithic occupation. So, in many cases, here you have long-term use, even if it was not necessarily continuous use, of the same sites. Now, all the work that was done in advance of construction of Iron Gates 1, which was the excavation of Lepenskivir, Blazats, and uh, one or two other sites, Queen of Tukunwi on the Romanian side, um, led to a particular view of the nature of Mesolithic settlement in the Iron Gates, which I've tried to sum up in this slide. It was not necessarily the view of the excavators, but it was the review of outside observers, people like Ruth Tring and Barbara Wojtek, that uh, one could see a kind of trajectory uh, beginning in the late glacial where people were nomadic hunter-gatherers using cave sites, moving around, and then gradually, or at some point, uh, during the Holocene, you started to get the establishment of fishing villages on the bank of the Danube, and from that point onwards, uh, there's what Trevich called the Lepensky beer culture, and uh, Vasily Baran called the scalar cladovic culture, because those were the sites they were digging. Um, you have this idea of increasing complexity culminating in uh, uh, sites like Lepensky Via. And even the idea of a, a Mesolithic survival long after farming had appeared in the, the areas round about. Now, of course, this idea, and I think this, is a, this is, uh, comes from a statement made by Ruth Tringham. Um, uh, the idea of complex foragers becoming more complex with time. Well, what are the archaeological correlates of complexity? Uh, we go back to the Price and Brown idea of things. Uh, well, we can emphasize sedentism, food storage, um, elaborate ritual practices. And the question is, how many of these things can we actually recognize in the archaeological record of the Iron Gates? Well, I've already referred to this, <laughs> agglomeration versus aggregation, and that's just my definition of agglomeration, if we think of large groups uh, permanently in one place versus aggregation, which are temporary comings together of several groups to form larger groups. What we should be aware of in the Iron Gates is all the, what I call the research inconsistencies. Um, you're at the one end of the scale, you get a site like Lipensky Beer, which was a big excavation going on over five years where they uncovered 3,000 square meters of the site and revealed all that remarkable evidence. Many other sites were excavated on a much smaller scale, so there's a lot of you know, big differences in uh, the way sites were excavated, the approaches to excavation uh, in this, because they were looking at many sites in a very short period. So we have to bear that in mind with the Iron Gates. The other problem is chronology. Um, back in the 1960s, or even right up until the 1990s, we had a very poor idea of chronology in the Iron Gates. Uh, it was all based on uh, site stratigraphy and typology and ideas <coughs> of Lepensky being one, two, and three, and all that. Nowadays, uh, Adina Baranansi sitting back there and I, and we work at Scalar Cladovy, 
Um, which is here on the Romanian bank, one of the few sites you can still access, because most of the others are now submerged. Um, we take a kind of, our definition of Mesolithic is uh, not a period that begins at the beginning of the Holocene, but actually begins at the, uh, with the building Alarith interstadial 12,000, 12,500 years ago. Um, there's no clear way of dividing up the Mesolithic into stages in terms of cultural changes. So we, we use the climatic record. Uh, so uh, for the sake of argument, we say early Mesolithic is the late glacial. Middle Mesolithic is the period between the Younger Dryas and the 9.3 Ka event. And then late Mesolithic between the 9.3 and the 8.2. And then somewhere during the 8.2, you get the transition to farming. Um, just convenient. And these are the radio, uh, mean radiocarbon ages. And you can see how most of it is grouped at the, the most recent end. So we have a not very good idea uh, of what goes on in the very early Mesolithic and middle Mesolithic. Now, uh, of course, big uh, uh, advancements were made in our understanding of chronology with the application of uh, AMS radiocarbon dating and uh, Alongside this, the use of stable isotopes for looking at uh, paleo diets. But one thing we can say about the Iron Gates is the conditions for agglomeration, the conditions for living, for people living in large groups in one place, were clearly there in the Iron Gates. It's a it's a big river with huge fish resources, and, and these are people, you know, from the early 20th century. Uh, see the, the amount of fish they're pulling out of the Danube on a daily basis. Now. And stable isotopes have shown us from the, the work uh, I did and others did in the beginning in the early 1990s that uh, people in the Iron Gates through the Mesolithic, uh, you know, were regularly consuming fish from the Danube. Um, question is, was that a year-round activity or was it a seasonal activity? Um, all the early work was based on carbon and nitrogen isotopes, and then later on, the work of uh, um, Nalik and uh, colleagues, uh, they introduced sulfur isotopes into the equation. And we can, there's been a bit of argument about what the sulfur isotopes actually mean, but I think one thing we can get from the sulfur isotopes is it shows that things are more complex than we thought based on carbon and nitrogen. And what we can say from the sulfur is that there seems to be a been in the course of the Mesolithic and the Iron Gates an increase in dependence on fishing. They were always fishing right from the Lake Glacial, but there was an increase in dependence on fishing. I can't go into great details. And um, in parallel that, we've got this um, what, uh, it's not my term, I think Dushan Boric uses this term, uh, fish related symbolism. And this you know, along with the increase in dependence on fishing, we see this fish-related symbolism coming into the Iron Gates. It's re uh, reflected, in fact, in the presence of siphonid teeth uh, in burials. Uh, Dushan Boric and Manuel Cristiani wrote about this in the context of Lazat. And this is a little reconstruction where these uh, pharyngeal teeth, or the tops of them, uh, broken out of uh, um, the pharyngeal bone of uh, carp, or a particular species of carp, are probably sewn, we know they were sewn onto skin or textile clothing or garments. And it wasn't just for burial, they found in burials, but it wasn't just for burial because these things that we've shown are very, very heavily worn uh, and they must have been worn over a long, long period uh, in life. Uh, and then, of course, the other end of the scale, we've got the carved boulders from the Pensacovia. And all this is a late phenomenon. Uh, this comes in about 7,200 BC, about a thousand years before uh, the beginning of farming. So this goes along with the, the isotope evidence for increased emphasis on fishing. Um, now, year-round occupation in the Iron Gates seems to me would have been an unlikely without food storage. Living in one place in a big group all year round would have been difficult without some form of food storage. Uh, although the fish are there year-round, catching them is not easy at certain times of year. And there are particular times of year when you're thinking of sturgeon migration, sturgeon coming up from the Black Sea, uh, when you can exploit the sturgeon at other times of year when they're not there. So winter would have been a lean time for anybody fishing in the Danube. It was difficult to catch carp and catfish 
in the winter. So without food storage, uh, you're going to have difficulty. Uh, that's a sturgeon, a beluga, I believe. Um, that's a, if you want to, if Dean would like to translate that, it's quite an amusing <laughs> comment. But do we get storage facilities in the Iron Gates? Uh, well, <coughs> not that we can recognise archaeologically, but as I pointed out in Trent before, uh, people kept dogs in the Iron Gates, uh, in the Iron Gates Mesolithic. Uh, they kept dogs in large numbers, and they ate dogs in large numbers because dog bones are found, which are with scorched, buttery marks on them, and so forth. So, and I pointed out before that this is an indirect form of storage. You, the dogs will scavenge around the site, will basically feed themselves on the human food refuse, and then at times when you haven't got the fish, you eat the dogs. Um, now, what the ethnographic record for hunter gatherers would probably show us that uh, when people are living in, the, in one place for a longer period of time, uh, in bigger groups, you tend to get a greater investment in structuring of the use of space, uh, the way in which huts or houses are arranged. And we can see this in a sense if we accept these trapezoid plan buildings, uh, the Penske Bear and Pavin, as houses or huts. You can see how it's all neatly arranged, particularly the Penske Bear in Rhodes. But that again is a very late phenomenon in the Iron Gates. In fact, Pavin, there was some question as to whether this is Mesolithic or Neolithic. Uh, there was a big argument, it's even a question as to whether this is Mesolithic or Neolithic. It's a big argument, but I, I think it's now fairly certain. Uh, the trapezoidal plan buildings at the Penske Beer are final Mesolithic. Uh, and it may also be the same at, uh, uh, at Palamon. Uh, <coughs> the radiocarbon dates uh, are not clear enough to tell us. If we go back a bit earlier into the late Mesolithic here, places like Laza, and Iquana and Scala Cladaby on the Romani Romanian bank, yes, we have evidence of trapezoidal plan buildings, but not like this. It's very few. And because the sites haven't been excavated as extensively as Lepanski Vera Blast, that's, we can't really say how regular the arrangement of these buildings was. But my impression is that there are far fewer buildings and they're not regularly arranged in these sites. Certainly not at scale kind of very uh, When you go back even earlier, into the early Mesolithic, we haven't got any obvious hut structures. But having said that, there's all the activity that goes on on these sites which are being intermittently occupied throughout the Mesolithic. So Neolithic and late Mesolithic occupation tends to destroy early, early Mesolithic occupation. Seasonality. Nobody really looks at this uh, until recently. Vesna Dimitrievich and colleagues have looked at this. There have been very few studies. What they concluded was that uh, the sites they looked at, and there was very little evidence, uh, were occupied year-round. The seasonal indicators did indicate occupation at different times of year. And again, they thought that this, they only found this in the late Mesolithic. So, in conclusion, the evidence points to, I think, greater emphasis on fishing in the late uh, and final Mesolithic. Uh, possibly an increased investment in the structuring of settlement space, culminating in what we see at the Penistivir and Padana. Uh, by implication, perhaps larger group size and sedentism, but I don't think we can rule out sedentism uh, in the earlier Mesolithic here. Thank you.